You're listening to Country Music Success Stories featuring Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris. Now, here's your host, Candy O'Terry. When you're invited to interview someone in their own home, it's extra special because, well, home is where the heart is, right? J.C. and I hopped in the car and we made our way to a sweet little cottage just outside of Music City. It was owned by a singer-songwriter and entertainer who has been a trailblazer for women in country music. Jeannie Seeley is a Grammy winner and a 53-year member of the Grand Ole Opry. In fact, she would become the first woman ever to host the Opry. You know, I've made some mistakes in trying to push forward and be a trailblazer. There's a way to do it and a way not to. As we settled into her cozy back porch, the cicadas started singing and Jeannie started talking about a career she is very proud of. Is this the Cumberland River? This is the Cumberland River. Yes, it is. And unfortunately, 10 years ago, that river was three foot up into my home here. But I love it so much. I've never lived any place as much as I love this place. It's so a little cottage, go. and it's just kind of magical. We'll have to take a picture. Okay. Your career started when you were 11 years old, singing on a little radio station called WMGW in Meadville, Pennsylvania. What do you remember about that experience? Let's go in the Wayback Machine. Tell me about that time in your life. Well, it all came about because uh, this local band came to the little town that I actually lived in, Townville, and doing a dance for a fundraiser for the fire department, which was very common in the rural areas. And I heard the band leader say, we have a a young lady here who sings. And so I'm all excited thinking, oh, my goodness, there's a little girl that sings, you know. And then he called my name and I looked (laughs) over in the corner. My big brother, Don, and his friends were all laughing, poking each other. And I thought, the joke is on you because I'm going to go do it. So I went up and sang. And then they asked me to do the radio show the next morning. There were no earphones. They had to stack up a couple of wooden Coke cases for me. It wouldn't adjust the microphone. We're pretty rural back then. So you probably had to be on a little pedestal just to, yep. hit, just to reach the microphone. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what we did. At so. 16, you were asked to perform on a TV station. Did your friends watch you on this show? And I'm guessing you were kind of a local celebrity by the time you were 16. Well, either a local celebrity or the brunt of a lot of jokes, you know, because uh, a lot of the kids made fun of me because I sang country music. And that is why my home is is named Pennsylvania, because growing up, that was kind of a put down if you sang country music or if you lived way out in the country. It's like, oh, man, she's she lives way out there in Pennsylvania somewhere. So I hated it growing up. But then after I was an adult, I thought, you know what? I'm pretty darn proud of being from own Pennsylvania. It. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. Our childhood shapes our life, and you grew up on a farm. Can you tell us a little bit about your family and, and the farm? It was a small farm. My dad worked in a steel mill, really. But then all the farming was done by us on the evenings and the weekends and during the summer. My parents uh, were wonderful, loving people. I was the youngest of four children. It is not true that I was spoiled at all. I don't care what you've heard. (laughs) I don't know how you can be spoiled when you grow up on a farm. Did you have to do chores every day? Of course. Yeah. Inside and outside. And like I said, it wasn't uh, one fun story from my childhood. My dad decided at one point we should have chickens, so he built what he thought was a chicken coop. And my mother was saying, no, I don't want them. I don't like chickens. I don't want them running around in my yard. So while they were arguing about whether or not we were going to have chickens, I moved in and made it a playhouse. (laughs) So then my dad said, okay, she wins. So he came in and he built little partitions and made made a little playhouse for me, and that lasted for a little while. And then my brother and I tore the petitions down and built a stage in one end. 
strung a clothesline across and pinned a sheet, and we had a, we were in show business. So the lady who is one of the hosts on the Grand Old Opry, her first stage was in a chicken coop. Is that what you're telling me? That's exactly what was meant to be a chicken coop. It never had any chickens in it. You learn an awful lot about life by growing up on a farm. But what, that's my childhood. What were your values? What Was there a golden rule in your house? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the golden rule, treat other people like you want to be treated. It was, you know, and I remember uh, mother always, she had a famous thing, you know, of uh, if you'd say, I can't do this. And she would say, if you think you are beaten, you are. That was a common thing we heard. (laughs) And you'll never know unless you try. Those are great words of wisdom. Oh, absolutely. And they work They work today, don't they? With an old Ford Falcon, and I do know what those look like, and 50 bucks in your pocket, you make your way to Nashville. What did your parents say about this plan? I have to correct you here. It was a new Ford. It was a brand new Ford? It was, no, well, comparatively new. I had had an MGA Roadster. And oh, the well, engine, excuse me. Yeah, it was in mint shape. But back then in the 60s, women could not get credit like men could. The engine blew up. I begged them to let me borrow the money to put a new engine in it. And they wouldn't do it. The bank wouldn't do it. But they would sell me a newer car, so I had to trade my beloved MGN, and it was the 63 Ford Falcon Sprint shift on the floor. Everything about that was the Mustang except the body style, so I was pretty cool. Can you still drive a standard? Oh, yes, ma'am. Of course. You got to have guts to do what you just did, and so my question is, were you scared? You must have felt very alone, and I know There was somebody who took you under her wing. I had known of Dottie West from the Landmark Jamboree in Cleveland. So she was booked at the Palomino Club in North Hollywood. And I went to see her and, of course, waited after the show. And when I told her I remembered her from the Landmark, she just said, oh, my goodness. She said, I don't even remember the last time anybody remembered that show. And it was like an immediate connection. And she encouraged me to move to Nashville. And uh, she said, you know, I'll help you. I'll introduce you to people and uh, I'll be there to do anything I can to help you. And she did start it out recording some of my songs, too. You know, what's interesting about that is if you have a champion in your corner, the door gets opened, but then you got to walk through it and you got to deliver the goods. Talk a little bit about your early years in Nashville. You must have a champion, and if that champion is a woman, that is extra pluses all the way around. Dottie and I struggled trying to get our songs heard back then, too, you know, as writers. Say an artist came in town to record, the, all the male songwriters would pile up on their bus or down in their motel room or in a bar somewhere And we really couldn't do that. So that was one of the early struggles that I saw here uh, that was a pretty tough wall to bridge. I wish we'd have known about this earlier, but later on there's a group of women who are very interesting that call themselves uh, the Chicks with Hits. And they are uh, publishers or song pluggers, and they have a deal. They take Two or three will go together to a producer and strengthen numbers. It's strength in numbers and the support of other women was what we need. Your first hit song, what was it? Take me back. When I moved to Nashville, the very first thing that I had was a song called Don't Touch Me. And Fred Foster at Monument had told Hank Cochran and me that he would record me if we found the right song. He had the first verse, and he called me and said, what do you think? I said, you have me at the first line. Your hand is like a torch. And I I loved it. I loved the whole feeling. So he flew to Rochester, New York, and actually we finished it in my dressing room. He called me the next morning and said, I think I wrote a smash last night. Tell me you remember it. And I said, every word, every note. Don't touch me. Number one song. It also won you a Grammy. 
Absolutely. Take me back to recording the song. You know, you just said you knew it was a hit. He knew it was a hit. You just get a vibe from something, and it just feels so right. When he asked me, what do you want to sing? I said, I want to sing a ballad. I want a song that you don't have to be married, single, male, female, young, old, that that song will touch you. And I think that he captured that. But on the session, and by the way, we only did three takes, and we went back, and the record was the very first take. They just kept saying, hey. We can't, we can't match this. No. Was that your motion. scratch track? Well, we we didn't do those back then. We just were all in the studio at the same time and did the whole thing. But as it went on, I maybe corrected a couple of notes, but they're saying, no, the emotion's not there, that raw emotion that was there. That record didn't sound like anything that had been on the market. When Fred Foster decided to just start it with one note on a vibe, I mean, it just got everybody's attention. 53 years ago, <laughs> you became a member of the Grand Old Opry. Can you explain how membership in the Opry works and why this is such mecca for country singers? The Grand Ole Opry is an institution unlike any other. That spirit, that love, that respect for what we do and awareness that we are reaching millions of people. Of course, like every other artist, I wanted to perform on that stage. But growing up listening to the Opry, I heard the fun, the love, the rapport between those artists, Mr. Acuff, Miss Minnie, Cousin Jody. And I thought, I want to be a part of that. I want that family. Lots of firsts for you as an artist in the Grand Old Opry. The first member from Pennsylvania. The first woman to host a segment on the stage. Hard one. Woo. <laughs> And I guess it, it was kind of like the boys club, right? And along comes Jeannie Seeley. Tell me how that happened. Well, I just kept kicking on those doors. Every manager that came in, I would make an appointment and I'd go in and I'd lay out my story, you know. And they would just tell, I'm like, why, why can't women host it? Why are we, treat you know, it's tradition. And I'd say... Well, let's make have, a new one. Have you ever noticed that it kind of smells like discrimination? <laughs> don't want to call it that, but let's don't say it. But anyway, it wasn't until Bob Whitaker came in as manager of the Opry when I went in and talked to Bob. He was just looking at me like, what are you saying? He didn't even realize that women couldn't. He had been managing Opryland Park. And he was used to all the production shows out there. Everybody had a microphone. Everybody had lines to speak. Everybody had a song. They were equal playing field. So he gave me the opportunity. He finally did. He said, Celia, I'm going to run you out there. But you better be able to do the job or we're all in trouble. <laughs> Not only did you do the job, but you were also the first person to wear a miniskirt on that stage. Is that true? It is, and let me explain the significance of that. When I did that, not even aware of what I was doing, I was just wearing what I wore. And when I got away with it, that tore down that wall, that unwritten thing that you had to wear, the checks and the ruffles, so the other girls could all wear what they wanted. It might be sequins, it might be pantsuits. But that just changed that playing field to wear what you want. To. You know, and so. I'm shaking my head and everyone in the room who is listening to this interview is doing the same thing because that's what's called being a trailblazer. When you do something that's a little out of lockstep, mm -hmm. you open a door for another woman to jump in and exercise her own right to wear whatever she wants to wear on that stage. Absolutely. It is so hard, Jeannie, to keep up the momentum as a singer and a songwriter, but you did it for 13 consecutive years on the Billboard Country Music Charts. What is the key to that kind of success? What kind of work ethic do you need to have? A very strong work ethic, which is another trait that I was taught at home. My saying is, until you're ready to get out of the race, You've got to keep running. I think the right song is a real strong key to success in the recording field. Of course, the industry keeps changing. So 
you have to pay attention and keep up with that, too. You started singing with Opry member Jack Green, and you had a big hit called Wish I Didn't Have to Miss You. And the two of you ended up touring together for more than a decade. I love duets. Tell me about that partnership. (laughs) I love duets, too. And I think during that time period, uh, we were both featured singers on the Ernest Tubb television show. And that was early TV and country music. So there were a lot of technical breakdowns. So when they're doing all that, it may be an hour before you start again. So we just pull out a guitar and sing. That's when Jack and I realized we both had the raspy, husky quality to our voices. The smoky voices. voice that I always wanted on the radio. I always wanted that deep, really? smoky voice thing going on right there. Well, <laughs> anyway, we noticed that our voices blended. So I was getting ready to make a label change, and so we went to DECA. During that time, that was the trend in country music to do what we called package shows, would be a known male singer, known female, and do a duet. Then when you toured together, that promoter had the whole thing, Conway Loretta, Bill Anderson, Jan Howard, you know. And so we just got into that same trend. And it was a wonderful run. But then it was time to realize, you know, he wanted different things. I wanted different things. And all of a sudden, we weren't individual entertainers anymore, so we had to to do that. And I'm, I'm glad I did. I wouldn't trade anything for those years we had together, but I'm glad that we split when we did while we had time to build our individual careers again. You know, I'm looking at this legacy of yours. You've performed at Madison Square Garden, at Wembley Stadium. Audiences large and small, whether you're hosting, whether you're singing, how do you reach out and touch the audience? My job is not to show my talent or what I'm wearing. My job is to reach those people and entertain them, make them feel something, Make them glad they came. A DJ, just like me. You served (laughs) as a DJ on Armed Forces Radio. What a trip. Tell me about that. Yeah, that was way back in 67. Every now and then I'll run into a veteran who said, yeah, you used to get me up. You came into Vietnam at 5 o'clock in the morning. or And they'd say, you and Reveille got me up every morning. So... Yeah, it's wonderful to uh, hear from all of them and know that you reached, of course, the military tours that I did, too. Uh, I wouldn't take anything for those years. I wouldn't want to do them again, but I'm glad I did them. Where do you keep your Grammys? I have a cabinet in my living room that has all of my treasures there. When an obstacle is in your path, how do you get around it, Jeannie? Depends on what the obstacle is, if it's a thing or a person. (laughs) If I'm big enough to move the thing, I do. If not, I call somebody that is. If it's a person, my first question is, why are you an obstacle? Why don't you want me to go where I want to go? Do you want to go with me? Do you, what, what am I looking at here? That's my first thought. Who were your musical role models, and what did you learn from them? Well, you know, at my age, there weren't a lot of female role models for me. Uh, Ernest Tubb, because I was a kid in World War II, born in 40, so Ernest Tubb was a big influence. Little did I have any idea what an influence he would be after I moved to Nashville and that he would really help me and... uh, so I've always been grateful for that. Um, certainly, I was a fan of Kitty Wells. She was one of the early ones that let me know Brenda Lee because she's younger than me. And I saw here as a kid, I was just a teenager, but here was Brenda, what, nine years old on TV. So, And to know that she's my one of my best friends now is amazing to me. But then as the 50s came in, my teenage years and all, Joe Stafford, 
the Maguire sisters, all of those female acts from the 50s hit parade. I never met Elvis, but I did meet Pat Boone, and I got to introduce him on the Opry, and I let him know that he made me popular in high school because there was an old piano, and I could play Ain't That a Shame and Love Letters in the Sand, and all the kids would sing along. So between Elvis Presley and Pat Boone, they made me popular in the 50s. Last couple questions, and thank you so much for your generosity and your time in this interview, Jeannie. Sometimes we have to learn our lessons the hard way. Has that been true for you? Is there anything you had to learn the hard way that you could pass along? Probably I'm still learning how to be quiet. you got to be so careful what you say because you can innocently make a comment or a post that can be taken so wrong. So I've had to learn the hard way that... Not everybody gets my humor, and that's probably one of the hardest things. I've made some mistakes in trying to push forward and be a trailblazer. There's a way to do it and a way not to, and that was some of the hard lessons that that I learned. As you look back on this incredible career, Jeannie, what are you most proud of? I am proud that I'm still here (laughs) and viable at 80 years old and that people like you and your listeners would still want to hear what I think and what I'm doing. That's amazing to me. I'm very proud of the longevity. I'm also proud of the changes that I've made. I've, I worked a lot behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about. I served on the board of AFTRA for over 30 years and fought very hard and went against some powerhouses like Mr. Acup to get the Opry to recognize AFTRA as our bargaining power so that we could end up with health insurance and pensions. So it was a pretty scary time during that, but that's one thing I'm very proud of. If you could talk to Jeannie Seeley, who was driving her car into Nashville all those years ago, what would you say to her? You know what I would say to her is, you were right, Jeannie. You were right to make this move. People say all the time, follow your heart. I believe in following your instincts. I believe your instincts are your guardian angels. Final question. We all value success in different ways, and sometimes at different parts of our lives, we see it differently. Right now, sitting on your beautiful porch overlooking the Cumberland River, how do you measure success? I measure success today the same way I always have. What was important to me was to be able to do what I love for a living and basically get my own way, do it the way I wanted to do it, and still have a life. I wanted normalcy as well as success in a career, and it's hard to balance that. Yes, there were times when I would love to have seen my name and lights in Las Vegas, but I also knew what you had to do to get that, and I was not willing to give up the freedom. I have a sign on my front porch, among others, that says, never get so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. I want to say thank you so much, Jeannie Seeley, for being our guest. It was such a pleasure to get to know you. Thank you. Thank you, and please come back and visit Nashville. We'll have more stories for you. That was the amazing story of a true trailblazer and a woman I greatly admire, Jeannie Seeley. Hi, I'm J.C. Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. One of the things I love the most about Jeannie is her deep knowledge of country music, and not just about the artists who rose up the ranks alongside her. She knows all about the ones who came before her and about the ones who are currently walking down the path that she helped to pave for them. I once heard someone say, if you really want to educate yourself in the field that you aspire to have a career in, you should learn about your idol's idols. When I work with an artist who is just starting out in their career, I always tell them to spend as much time as possible learning about the history of country music. Think about it. If it wasn't for the path being paved for artists and musicians that you admire, they wouldn't be there for you to admire at all. I grew up watching and listening to the Grand Ole Opry, so I had a pretty solid grasp on the history of all of it when I moved to Nashville. But you'd be surprised about how many artists don't. 
I ask every new artist I work with about their knowledge of the history of country music because I know how important it will be for them to know this and how much more seriously they will be taken by the artists that they are aspiring to work with one day. If you're listening to this and you don't know what the Grand Ole Opry is, you need to. It's okay if you don't, but do yourself a favor and learn about it. If you're lucky enough to take a trip to Nashville, visit the Grand Ole Opry. And if you aren't in a position to get there just yet, head over to Opry.com and learn a little bit more about the stage that made country music so famous. When you're there, in person or online, scroll through the current members and learn a little bit about them and their careers. If it weren't for artists like Jeannie Seeley and Gene Shepard, or Bill Anderson and Little Jimmy Dickens, there would be no Lori Morgan, Kelsey Ballerini, Brad Paisley, or even Luke Combs. These Opry members paved the way for the artists of today, and the Grand Ole Opry is the best and truest reminder of what the Nashville music industry was built on. When learning about the Opry, you should also learn about the show's announcers, who have given a voice to its broadcast all over the world, and who have helped to make the show famous. Announcers like Bill Cody and Eddie Stubbs. Learn about WSM Radio and how long it has been broadcasting the sounds of country and bluegrass music. Without WSM, there would be no Opry broadcast. It launched only two months before the Opry began way back in 1925, and it's still going strong today. Whenever I feel like I need a little reminder of why I moved to this town, I go to the Opry and I take it in for a minute. It always seems to help. I still get goosebumps walking around the hallways and onto the side of the stage. Even though I've been there hundreds of times, every single time still feels exciting to me. There's some kind of magic inside that building. While you're learning, research the Ryman Auditorium. It was the original home of the Grand Ole Opry and it still hosts the Opry shows several months throughout the year. I encourage you to learn about all of it any chance you get. Buy a ticket and go. And don't just go to the show. Walk around the grounds. Walk around the hallways and take the tour. Learn about the people whose names are engraved on the walls and whose photos hang proudly inside each of the dressing rooms. I promise you'll be so glad you did. And you might learn something or meet somebody that could put you on a path to having your name on that wall one day. If you're wondering about how you can continue educating yourself on all of this, one of the best things you can do is take every opportunity you have to ask advice from the people who have done it all before you. If you don't know any of these people just yet, that's okay. One day you will, and you'll find yourself in a position to ask questions. I sure hope you take it when you do. I know that sometimes it can be hard to admit that we don't know everything. But if you are fortunate enough to find yourself with an opportunity to learn and grow, don't ever say no to it. And then someday, turn around and teach it all to somebody else. That is how we'll all keep the country music industry and places like the Grand Ole Opry going strong for years to come. JC took me to see the Opry during this trip to Nashville. She is so right. The Opry is a part of the heart and soul of country music. For a free tip sheet on the Grand Ole Opry, just go to candyoterry.com backslash country music podcast. Subscribe to JC's YouTube channel for insights and advice on how to make it in Nashville. And if you liked country music success stories, please subscribe and leave a review. Follow us both on social at Candy O'Terry and at JC Dawn Valeris. And thank you so much for listening.